In recent years, more than 300 people have died of unnatural causes in custody of the Bureau of Prisons. Deaths that too often have been the result of mismanagement and operational failures. An investigation by the Marshall Project and National Public Radio three years ago found that the Thompson Federal Prison in my home state of Illinois had become one of the deadliest prisons in America because of the now defunct Special Management Unit. I was shaken by the allegations in that article and immediately asked Inspector General Horowitz to examine them. We will discuss the results today. After media reports late last year alleged that some adults in custody died while waiting for necessary medical care, I called on BOP to change its procedures, staff, and supply medical units so that incarcerated individuals could receive the care they needed. It is evident that many of the issues the committee has highlighted over the years included un including understaffing, overuse of restrictive housing, and employee misconduct will continue to have deadly consequences if they go unaddressed. The Inspector General's report identified 344 non-medical deaths of adults in custody in its review period 2014 to 2021. A number of trends emerged that demonstrated increased risk to safety of individuals in BOP care. For example, 20% of these deaths were overdoses from contraband and prescription drugs. BOP continues to struggle with contraband interdiction and lacks adequate treatment for thousands of individuals fighting addiction. Understaffing, particularly in health and psychology services, strains their ability to provide quality care. Violations of BOP policy by staff, quote, present significant barriers to the BOP's ability to ensure institutional safety. This afternoon, my colleague, Senator Booker, chair of the Criminal Justice Subcommittee, will hold a specific hearing on prison staffing crisis. I thank him for his leadership. BOP's lengthy and ineffective discipline process fails to bring accountability for staff misconduct, and BOP consistently fails to use post-death reviews and proper record keeping to identify corrective actions. This failure to learn from past mistakes is most troubling when examining the role of restrictive housing in custodial deaths. Suicides accounted for just over half of the 344 deaths CIG reviewed. Almost half of those suicides occurred in restrictive housing, which is more commonly known as solitary confinement. We have a star stark reality when it comes to solitary confinement. This is cruel and unusual punishment that has been the norm in the United States for way too long. In 2012, I held the first ever congressional hearing on solitary confinement. At the time, nearly 8% of federally incarcerated individuals were in restrictive housing. After some progress under President Obama, we've returned to roughly the same percentage of people in solitary today. We know that overuse of solitary confinement causes lasting, irreparable, physical, emotional, and mental harm to incarcerated people. Moreover, it threatens public safety and strains prison budgets. I want to add to parenthetically, I understand some of the individuals we're talking about are dangerous people who need to be isolated under certain circumstances. I'm a realist about that. But this consistent reference of 8% is unacceptable. Earlier this month, the General Accounting Office released a report, which I requested with Senator Coons. It found that the Bureau of Prisons has failed to implement 54 of the 87 recommendations from two prior studies on restrictive housing. Let's be clear, the failure to decrease our over-reliance on restrictive housing is deadly, deadly. That is why I hold a, held a follow-up hearing on the dangers this spring. Director Peters, I understand many issues we're discussing today have been problems for years, long before you arrived, but it's time for solutions and change. The lives of hundreds of Americans in Bureau of Prisons custody are at risk. My colleague, Ranking Member Senator Graham, is under the weather today and won't be able to join us this morning and Senator Grassley was here momentarily to acknowledge the opening of this uh, committee meeting. Uh, he has another conflict in his schedule as well, but I want to proceed. We're going to have a swear in the witnesses. Each will have five minutes to provide an opening statement, then rounds of questions for each senator present of at least five minutes. So I ask individuals to please stand. Raise your right hand. Do you affirm the testimony you're about to give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Let the record reflect that both uh, 
have answered in the alternative, in the affirmative, I should say. And uh, we'll start with Inspector General Horowitz. You may proceed. I'm sorry, we couldn't hear. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, there well, you go. It was calling on me first. Was it's here. It? Yes, thank it you. is. Thank you. Perfect. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chairman Durbin, um, and thank you to members of this committee for holding today's important hearing. I also want to acknowledge with me are the team that worked on the deaths and custody report and went to visit sites, including USP Thompson, the prison that you mentioned in your opening statement. Um, I've been Inspector General now for tw almost 12 years, and every year I've included the BOP in my annual report of the top management and performance challenges facing the Department of Justice. Yet, with some notable exceptions, the problems at the BOP seem to only increase. Indeed, last year, the BOP was added to the GAO's high-risk list. To be clear, these are not new problems. Indeed, yesterday, we released a compendium of over 100 publicly issued OIG reports since 2002, reflecting the systemic challenges at the BOP that we've identified over the past two decades. Many of the 344 deaths that you mentioned that we found were due to suicide, homicide, drug overdose, or other unknown factors that we reviewed in the deaths in custody report have a direct connection to these challenges. And by the way, as we reference in our report, so did the high profile deaths of inmates Jeffrey Epstein in 2019 and James Whitey Bulger in 2018, as we detailed in those public reports that we issued. When the public wonders whether the treatment of those two high-profile inmates was unique, the answer, sadly, from our deaths in custody report is that it was not. Many of the 344 inmate deaths we discuss in the report were the result of similarly serious management and operational failures. These include long-standing management and operational challenges uh, that involve serious staffing shortages, including for correctional and healthcare positions, single selling of inmates, inappropriate mental health care designations of inmates, ineffective contraband interdiction, an outdated camera security system, staff failure to follow BOP policies and procedures, and an ineffective, untimely staff disciplinary process. Indeed, one or more of these challenges was a contributing factor in many of the inmate deaths in our scope, and these long-standing challenges continue to present a significant and critical threat to the BOP's safe and humane management of inmates in its care and custody. For example, we found that in nearly one third of the inmate deaths within our scope, contraband drugs or weapons contributed or appeared to contribute to the death. The rampant proliferation of contraband is a major challenge for the BOP, resulting in the BOP partially closing its federal penitentiary in Atlanta in 2021. And as our report notes, USP Atlanta had the highest number of deaths during the time period of our review. Ensuring that staff follows policies and procedures and are held accountable for serious wrongdoing is critical to improving the safety and security of BOP institutions for both inmates and the overwhelming majority of BOP employees who do their jobs with honesty and integrity. The OIG dedicates significant resources to investigate alleged criminal wrongdoing at BOP facilities, particularly sexual assault and contraband smuggling. As we've seen through our ongoing criminal investigation at FCI Dublin, where the warden, chaplain, and several other inmates have been convicted of sexual assault charges, failing to timely identify and address criminal wrongdoing can spiral and poison an institution's culture. Relatedly, our ongoing use um, our audit of BOP's use of restraints was prompted in large part by allegations that inmates at USP Thompson, which you referenced, and their special management unit were routinely placing four-point restraints for extended periods of time and were otherwise and that inmates were otherwise mistreated while restra restrained. This unit was recently closed by Director Peters in response to these and other concerns. Let me now turn to suicide which comprised, as you noted, the majority of the deaths we reviewed. More than half of those who died by suicide, as you noted, were in single cell confinement, despite BOP policy that strongly disfavors the use of single selling. Further, almost half the suicides, as you noted, occurred in restrictive housing units. Moreover, over 60% of inmates who died by suicide 
and be, had been designated at the lowest mental health treatment level. None of these are new issues. The OIG has repeatedly identified them in our prior reports, and the GAO has also raised them. We made 12 new recommendations in our death and custody report, and the, B and the BOP agreed with all of them, and we will carefully monitor the BOP's implementation of them. Effectively addressing these, <clears throat> these widespread systemic issues at the BOP requires a long-term vision and strategy from BOP and department leadership with support from the Office of Management and Budget, the Congress, and other important stakeholders. To be clear, the problems we've identified in our oversight work over the past 20 years won't be solved overnight, but they must be addressed with urgency to protect the health, safety, and security of BOP staff and inmates, and to enable inmates to successfully return to our communities upon their release from prison. Toward that end, I very much have appreciated my quarterly meetings with Director Peters and her desire to meet with me regularly. It's the first time in my 12 years as IG where that's occurred and we've, I think, made some important progress working together. Thank you, and I'd be pleased to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you, General. Director Peters. Good morning, Chairman Durbin, uh, Ranking Member Graham, who's not with us today, and members of the committee. I am pleased to be here with you and Inspector General Horowitz to discuss the Deaths in Custody Report. We welcome, agree with, Would and Would you pull the microphone just a little closer to you? Thank you. Yes. We, re we welcome, agree with, and are implementing the report's recommendations and have plans to go even further and take additional steps to mitigate unexpected deaths in custody. I have spent my entire professional career working in the public safety field, including as a victim advocate, working with victims who lost loved ones. I know any unexpected death of an adult in our care and custody is tragic and it changes the lives of the, that person's family and loved ones forever. We also experience these deaths as a heavy blow. I have been in our institutions in the days following unexpected deaths and I have seen our employees suffering due to the loss. Our core mission always is to care for those in our custody in hopes that they leave our facilities prepared to be good neighbors. When our best efforts are not successful and death does occur, we initiate review processes to understand the cause of these deaths so that we can prevent similar deaths going forward. But we can do better here and must ensure that our reviews go deep enough and our documentation is clear enough to support those reviews. Our psychological assessments conclude that many individuals who come to us come with mental illness, and substance use disorders, making them more susceptible to suicide, overdose, and homicide. So to combat these deaths, we work on root causes and have incorporated evidence-based treatments like medication-assisted treatment. We train our employees to recognize those at risk of attempting suicide, refer at-risk people for help, and respond to suicide attempts, and also train on the appropriate use of CPR, AEDs, naloxone, and cut-down tools, ensuring our employees have access to those tools in the workplace. The report notes that suicides occurred when people were single-celled or in restrictive housing. That is why we now provide special training to those who work in restrictive housing and limit the use of single selling. We have restrictive housing reforms underway now that will reduce the amount of time adults in custody spend in restrictive housing for disciplinary violations. We are creating a special post in restrictive housing to help those in custody transition from that rest restrictive housing environment to the general population and we're going to add employees in restrictive housing during the overnight shift. We continuously work to combat contraband to reduce homicides and overdoses. This includes heightened screening of mail, detecting and intercepting drones, monitoring or terminating cellular communications, and continually monitoring intelligence and gang activity. To harness all of this intelligence, we are creating a new chief inspector position to identify system-wide patterns and problems, including that that would prevent deaths in our custody. On a departmental level, the Deputy Attorney General has also formed a working group of experts to better prevent suicides. Again, I wanna be perfectly clear. Our employees are our everything, and fully staffed institutions and well-trained employees save lives. Yet it is no secret 
that our agency is in crisis as it relates to recruitment and retention. We are aggressively recruiting and utilizing incentives to maintain the employees I, we have. And while our efforts over this past year have gleaned results, we are still faced with an inability to compete with the private sector and other law enforcement agencies. As an example, at a federal prison about an hour outside of Boston, a correctional officer recently quit his job for a better offer with better pay. The better offer, working at the local grocery store. On the law enforcement side, an ad running in the New York City subway is advertising that city correctional officers can make around $130,000 after a few years on the job. While in the same amount of time, our officers, after we've implemented the 35% retention bonus, would be making about $90,000. The story is the same throughout the country. We need more resources to carry out our mission, implement our vision, and reach our goals. Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Graham, and members of the committee, thank you once again for this opportunity to speak on behalf of the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and I welcome your questions. Thank you very much. My interest in this issue started many years ago when I read an article in the Atlantic Mag Magazine by Atul Gawande, a doctor in Boston, about the impact of isolation and solitary confinement on the human mind not just in this correctional setting, but prisoners of war. He referenced our former colleague, John McCain, and what he went through after five years of that type of treatment and what impact it had on him. And Dr. Gawande, who now works for the USAID, reminded us that the majority of prisoners will ultimately be released. If they're damaged in the process of serving time in prison, they'll take that damage out into the open society and others may suffer. So this has been a long time issue. It's been 12 years since the first hearing under my uh, leadership uh, occurred in this committee. I voiced concerns over reliance on solitary confinement, pleaded with the directors now and before you uh, to do something about it. I'm gonna reintroduce my legislation, Solitary Confinement Reform Act, to limit the use of the practice. Director Peters, the latest statistics show that despite the decrease in Bureau of Prisons total population since you were sworn in as director in August of 2022, the percentage and total of num number of individuals in restricted housing is actually higher than it was at that time. As of this month, approximately 7.9% or 11,179 people are currently being held in some form of restricted housing, an increase of 0.6% since September 2022. Director Peters, you previously pointed to your contract with the National Institute of Justice when asked about your plans to address restrictive housing. What is the status of that study? Thank you, Senator. So the study is underway. NIJ has issued the contract. The individuals studying our restrictive housing have actually been on site and are visiting facilities, looking at our policies, our practices, and interviewing employees. We've also, we're also not just waiting for the results of that report. We're beginning to implement restrictive housing reform Currently, we have plans to approve a new policy that will actually reduce the amount of time an individual can be sanctioned to restrictive housing for disciplinary purposes. As I mentioned in my opening comments, we're adding additional resources to solve this problem. And in the short term, as you well know, in your very own state, we shut down the special management unit in quick order last year. Here's my concern. Since my first hearing on this issue in 2012, there have been multiple reviews of BOP policy. The latest came out earlier this month when the GAO published a report I requested. According to their report, BOP has not fully implemented 54 of the 87 recommendations from two prior studies on improving restrictive housing practices. One of those studies from 2014 was conducted by an external consultant. It made 34 recommendations, only 16 have been fully implemented and a 2016 evaluation completed by the Department of Justice under the Obama administration, which President Biden ordered the Attorney General to implement in 2022, made 53 recommendations and only 17 have been implemented. The time for studies is over. The death rate in our prisons is unacceptable. The damage to mental health is unacceptable. My question to you is what steps can you commit to today to immediately reduce restrictive housing populations. 
Thank you, Senator. I think there are a variety of things that we're doing today, including approving that policy that's been long standing, negotiated with our national union, and that will decrease the amount of time that individuals can actually be sanctioned to restrictive housing for disciplinary purposes. The data also reveals that many of the individuals are in, in, that are in restrictive housing are in there many times at their own choice because they fear their ability to walk in general population. So we are working on creating cultures and environments that are more normal and humane, so those individuals actually feel comfortable in general population. And then, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, we're creating positions who will work in restrictive housing, and their sole responsibility to, will be working with those individuals who don't want to leave restrictive housing and help them transition into general population. We did this in the state of Oregon, and it was very successful, so we're looking forward to rolling that out um, this year. Um, we we're also looking at best practices across the country and around the globe to implement changes. As I shared with you the last time that we met, this last year has been filled with strategic planning for the department. We've rebooted our mission, our vision, our values, and many of the goals that we're working on will tie into restrictive housing. Both a strong plan around restrictive housing reform and building morale and working on our recruitment and retention issues, which are at the core of many of the issues, as the Inspector General pointed what out. What percentage of people in restrictive housing have volunteered to be in that housing? That number is almost 40%. Um, and we are looking at the data as we um, get even closer into the data. It might even be higher than that because we have individuals that are categorized as PC status, which falls into that 40%, but also individuals that are on transition status, and those two could fit into that category. Aside from that category and those that are incarcerated because of their danger to other uh, prisoners and cellmates, uh, I'd like to ask you, do you accept the premise that those who are put in restrictive housing involuntarily run the very real risk of serious mental illness or worse? Senator, I would argue that everyone who is in restrictive housing has uh, the, um, will suffer from some form of mental or physical um, damage. I, I think even those that are agreeing or wanting to be in restrictive housing need to be educated on the fact that that isn't where they belong and that we need to be able to safely house them in GP. Just because they're volunteering to be there doesn't mean that the physical and mental wear and tear isn't happening for them as well. And I think that's what that position that we're wanting to create to put into restrictive housing will help combat. We also have reintegration units for those individuals where we actually have step down uh, programs and units that help people get out of restrictive housing and we need to do better there as well. Thank you. Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good to see you again. Always appreciate our conversations with you. I know our hearing today is focused on uh, deaths of the incarcerated, but I want to change the topic just a little bit and look at the treatment of our BOP officers and focus on what is happening with some of the assaults against our staff, BOP staff, and um, not only the physical, but the PTSD, and some of those uh, issues that occur. And yesterday I introduced the Safer Prisons Act, which would double the maximum term of imprisonment for assaulting a BOP correctional officer. And Director Peters, for you, I, I know you'd agree that these assaults present a real danger for the Bureau of Prisons, so I'd like to have your support on the Safer Prisons Act and have you uh, support doubling that maximum term. Thank you, Senator. Well, you know there are processes with the Department of Justice in terms of component heads being able to support legislation, but I will tell you that the safety and security of our employees are the are essential. They are our everything. If they don't feel safe in our institutions, yeah. um, then we have lost the core of our mission. Let me ask you this. You mentioned hiring and retention mm -hmm. as an issue. Do you think the safety or the lack of safety and protection plays into that difficulty in hiring and retention. 
I think that we do our best through augmentation and overtime in order to ensure that the posts that need to be filled are filled, but you and I have talked before. Augmentation is a great resource in the short term, and we've been using it in the long term to solve a long-term recruitment and retention problem, and it is making our people exhausted. Um, they are riveted with overtime. Augmentation impacts FSA programming and operations. Visiting is sometimes canceled because we don't have the people to support those posts. So we have a lot of work to do in this area, and we've thrown every incentive and direct hire authority and everything that okay. we can, but we need to go further. Okay. You and I have previously discussed Jeffrey Epstein, and the chairman knows I've been trying to subpoena his flight logs and Jelaine Maxwell's little black book. I think it's essential as we look to break apart these sex trafficking rings that not only are here in the U.S., but have grown to be global entities, $150 billion a year business globally, trafficking human beings, primarily women and girls. So while Epstein was in BOP's custody, did you ever have access to his unredacted flight logs or to Jelaine Maxwell's Little Black Book? So as a former victim's advocate, I know that you and I share values around combating sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. uh, the Epstein um, situation happened before my tenure at the yeah. Federal Bureau of Prisons, so I was not a part of any of that evaluation and would turn to the Inspector General for any of those questions. Okay. Um, Senator, I don't, I don't know the answer as I sit here. We can certainly make an inquiry. I would like to have now. that answer in writing, okay. if you will. Yeah, that I mean, we will we'll ask the BOP, obviously. We don't have right. the information you're looking Absolutely. for. We'd have to ask the BOP. I, right. I appreciate that, but I would like a response in writing. I also, Director Peters, there is, um, uh, ha we have heard that BOP is helping to transport migrants from the southern border into the country, and the Bureau has confirmed that it has provided transportation for migrants since CBP has been inundated with the surge at the southern border. And we've talked before about the extensive staffing challenges at BOP and the negative consequences that come with that. So are you comfortable with having to dedicate your resources that are already stressed to alleviate President Biden's border surge? So as a fellow law enforcement agency inside the department, uh, we of course support supporting other components in helping with crisis. It's one of the okay, things that we do well. Let me ask you this. My time's but, about to run out. Have you ever transported an individual who was on the terrorist watch list? Senator, I don't know the answer to that Could question. Could you look into that and respond in writing? I will have my team look into it, and we'll get back to you with information that's available. Excellent. And my time is up, but as always, I'm going to mention the Memphis facility. And you and I have such an ongoing conversation are around that, and I do look forward to getting an update on that from you. Thank you, Senator. I Thank did you. check this morning, and it looks like the timelines that we have provided the last time we checked are on target. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for having this hearing. Uh, you know, correctional officers, as I know from having been United States Attorney and then Attorney General of our state, in Connecticut are among the hardest working and least appreciated. Whether at the state level or federal level, they have to deal with dangerous situations every day. Their work is out of public sight for good reason, because obviously they're in confinement situations. And so uh, I am very, very sympathetic to the point that you made, Director Peters, about the need for retention, recruitment, and uh, appreciation of the working conditions and the compensation that they deserve. And I wonder, short of additional compensation, whether there are working condition issues that could be addressed, mandated overtime, other kinds of demands placed on them that maybe can be mitigated through better scheduling, better 
accommodations for them in their leisure moments during the job? Maybe you could comment. Thank you, Senator Will. I appreciate those comments greatly. I think you're right. They are unsung heroes. They're people that don't get lifted up. And I will say to any other law enforcement agency, I think correctional officers have the toughest beat in public safety. And the wear and tear, you know the data. One in three have PTSD. Um, many are exhausted with overtime and augmentation. And so, yes, we have to change the cultures inside our institutions. We're working on creating more normalized and humanized environments so that they feel less institutional. Our maintenance and repair backlog is about $3 billion. So when I visit our institutions, our wardens are just as excited to show me the new FSA programming and treatment as they are the walls that are crumbling and the stairwells that are crumbling. And so that type of an environment is no place for anyone to live or work. And so we have a lot to do to change the environment for our correctional officers. The FEV survey says that the Federal Bureau of Prisons is the worst place to work in federal government. So we have a lot of work to do to help support our correctional officers who are exhausted. Correctional officers work behind bars. That's right. They work eight hours a day, sometimes more, with people, let's be very blunt, who have often committed very violent acts that put them behind bars. And so the more we can do to improve those institutional settings, the more we can change the environment for them and perhaps the way they react to the challenges they face. Would you agree? Thank you, Senator. I agree wholeheartedly. And while we have issued every authority in our power, like we've increased the base salary for COs by 2,000. We have recruitment and retention incentives across the country. We have direct hire authority. The bottom line, as I said in my opening comments, is we need to pay them more. That base, the, the, the retention incentive and recruitment incentives are band-aids. We have to figure out how to increase that base salary so that we can hire the best and the brightest and keep them. Mr. Horowitz, uh, in 2014, I led uh, an effort called the Death in Custody Reporting Act. Congress passed it, the President signed it. It included, among other things, a requirement for a study. We are here 10 years after the passage of that measure. Uh, there has been no study of uh, the data with respect to arrest-related and in-custody deaths. I agree wholeheartedly with the Chairman that the time for studies is over, we need action, but Studies sometimes can be informative and can guide action in the right direction. Uh, would you agree that study should be done? A absolutely, Senator. In fact, uh, one of the reasons we undertook this work was because there wasn't a set of data out there. And we shouldn't have to be the, f the first line of defense on these issues. Right? It should be the department itself. It should be the component itself that does that. It's, it's not happening as it should. And you point out, I think, uh, and I think, Director Peters, you make the point as well, that half of the 344 deaths by suicide have occurred with respect to prisoners who are in single cell housing or in solitary confinement. Now, I recognize that there are significant mental health components to the reasons for these suicides, but the correlation between that fact, isolation in a single cell, and death by suicide maybe ought to give us reason to change some of those policies. Would you agree? A absolutely, Senator. I think there are several figures that jump out uh, here. One is the fact that half of the folks are roughly half were in single cells, roughly half, little less, were in restricted housing. Um, and the one I mentioned in my opening, which is that over 60% of the suicide, of the individuals who died by suicide, were in the lowest mental health category. Of the four categories, they were deemed to not need mental health treatment. That's over 60% of people. And that's very concerning. That's something that needs to be addressed. Um, and something, frankly, we've highlighted before as a problem and an issue. Thank you. I, I want to thank the chairman for having this hearing. I want to thank you both for your public service. Correctional policy isn't the most glamorous, but it is among the most important 
of what we do in criminal justice. And uh, thank you both for your work. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Coons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you uh, to both of our witnesses for your testimony. Uh, Director Peters, uh, you have inherited leadership of a deeply troubled institution, and I suspect you some days feel like your job is more akin to trying to change the direction of an aircraft carrier than um, lead an agile and well-resourced uh, organization because its BOP is frankly neither. Um, and I appreciate the determination, openness, and vigor with which you've approached this task. And uh, to Inspector General Horowitz, it was very encouraging to hear that the two of you are working together responsibly, that instead of viewing the IG as a hostile party, um, you as a BOP director are uh, engaging around these issues. Nonetheless, as the chairman pointed out, uh, and I want to thank you, Chairman Durbin, for your uh, engagement and determination on this issue over many years. There are lots of recommendations that have not yet been fully implemented. There's lots of important policy work to do here. Uh, as uh, Senator Blumenthal just said, uh, federal corrections uh, is a really important part of our criminal justice system. It doesn't get the attention that it needs and deserves. Uh, I've long been concerned with the overuse of solitary confinement uh, and have appreciated the chance to work with Chairman Durbin in support of his Federal Solitary Confinement Reform Act now for several Congresses. Um, Director Peters, I, I just want to say I appreciate your leadership in establishing an internal task force and partnering with the National Institute of Justice to develop further recommendations on this issue. Um, but we've got lots of recommendations over many years of work. Inspector General, um, let's put aside just for the moment the issue of policy implementation and for focus first on the need to have policies to implement. Can you just briefly elaborate on what is lacking at an overall policy level now in terms of addressing restrictive, restrictive housing and single selling? Um, thank you, Senator. So that is one of the significant recommendations we've made in the past, many years ago, 2017 report, uh, about the lack of an overall policy guidance for when people should be put in restrictive housing and when they should be single-celled. Um, and we weren't alone in that. Actually, the BOP itself put together a 2021 task force and asked what should they do. They listed, had 11 recommendations, I believe it was, um, and one of them was implement the OIG's earlier recommendation and put in place this policy, and that is still an open recommendation. So. There needs to be an understanding among all the wardens in all 121 institutions that uh, what, when, and how should single selling be used. And let me just, if, if I could, Senator, just give you a sense during COVID, directive went out from BOP leadership to not use single selling as a quarantine method, unless there was an extraordinary reason to do so. Well, seven of the suicides were quarantined individuals during COVID, not because they were acting up, but because of COVID quarantine. By the way, five of the seven hadn't had the review done before they were single-celled to see if they had indicia of mental health illness for potential, and after action reviews indicated that maybe all seven did. Striking. Um, Director Peters, can you just respond to that particular question about having a policy in order to be able to implement it? Absolutely. And so here's what we've done. First, I want to say thank you for your comments about the partnership with the Inspector General. I'd love to say publicly that the partnership has been exceptional. I am the former Inspector General of the state of Oregon, so I know very much to respect his very hard job. And we are working on implementing all of the recommendations. Here's what we've done as it relates to the fine point of the question that you've asked. We have a policy, a restrictive housing policy, that has been under review and negotiation with the National Union for a very long time. We are so close to finalizing that policy, which will implement a lot of the Inspector General and GA AO's uh, recommendations. Furthermore, we have an exceptional relationship with the National Union, and the incoming president is working with us 
directly, and we're going to come up with a plan to streamline policy adoption so that we don't have significant delays and have this be a, a barrier to implementation of the Inspector General and GAO's recommendations. So we'll, we also have a future state um, and plan on how these policy negotiations will happen going forward. Good. That's encouraging. I would hate to see the clock run out on your opportunity to resolve these long-standing issues uh, and to have the union at the table and BOP leadership at the table and be, be implementing um, some of the IG's recommendations on this critical area is encouraging to me. I'll be following this, uh, and I know uh, the chairman will be legislating. Could I briefly ask one more question, Mr. Chairman, with the forbearance of my colleague down the dais. Um, when a federal defendant is found mentally incompetent to stand trial, uh, my understanding is uh, if they're released on bail, they're then required to be returned to custody to see if their competency can be restored in a BOP facility. But there's few facilities with this capacity. They have very long wait times. And that means that mentally ill but presumed innocent people can end up in interminable incarceration before they get the help they need and before the criminal justice process can proceed. This has led to charges being dropped in some cases due to speedy trial issues. Uh, Director Peters, can you speak about what BOP has been doing about this and will you work with me on helping identify ways that Congress can help specifically on this issue? Yes, thank you, Senator. So this is another ish, long-standing issue that the department has had around lack of resources that are resulting in this backlog of these reviews. And here's what we've done in the last year. We have added an additional beds at our, 40 additional beds at our facility in Chicago to help us un peel back this backlog. We are looking at adding additional beds this year at another facility that we've yet to, to determine but are working on a plan. We have also worked to create a psychology review team that's a traveling team that's gonna travel across the country now to help work on this backlog. And then further, we're working on a program where we can hire individuals who have their PhD but yet haven't completed their dissertation that would be able to come and help with these reviews as well. So this is a longstanding issue that we're trying to fix. It's a conversation that I've had with the U.S. attorneys uh, on many, uh, many occasions, um, but it is certainly in our sights. Thank you. Thank you both, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for thank your you leadership. Senator Coons. As we mentioned earlier, Senator Booker's Subcommittee on Crime is having a hearing uh, this afternoon on staffing in the federal prisons, which uh, has come up as in this morning's meeting uh, many, many times. So let me recognize Senator Booker. Um, first of all, thank you very much for this hearing, and I'm grateful for the two witnesses uh, uh, being here. Uh, before I get to just a question on staffing in general, I just want to talk about mental health and the well-being of both people uh, that are incarcerated as well as uh, the mental health of a lot of our uh, incredible correctional officers. Uh, suicide rates for both groups are alarming to me. Uh, nationally, according to this Society for Su uh, Suicide Prevention, it's about 14 out of every 100,000 Americans die of suicide annually. This is that'll, That number alone should cause concern for all Americans that it's so high. But people in custody die at rates that are much higher. Um, according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, in 2019, it was up to 20 out of every 100,000 persons. So I'm wondering, uh, first maybe perhaps, um, Director, for the uh, people that are uh, incarcerated, what steps is the BOP taking to curb uh, this extraordinary rate of uh, individuals uh, committing suicide in custody? Thank you, Senator. So we've done a variety of things. And while one suicide on our watch is one suicide too many, I think the things that we have implemented at the Bureau are represented in the data in that our suicide rate is less than the general population and less than state corrections. And I think it has to do a lot with the psychology resources that we do have. While I am going to argue for more and better pay for those doctoral level psychologists, they do do incredible work in terms of finding those individuals that need resources and then we wrap the, those resources around them and we have more work to do. We have um, are looking at our after action reports, looking to see if those uh, need to be more substantive. Are we sharing the data across the country when we find 
uh, issues that need to be resolved, resolved. I personally, Senator, read every reconstruction report and then meet with a multidisciplinary team to talk about what we've learned and how we're going to implement changes going forward. And then, and then just sticking with inmates, uh, in, in an OIG report, there was uh, a discussion of the inmate companion program uh, in which uh, institutions may utilize individuals who are in BP, BOP custody uh, in lieu of BOP staff. And it seemed to have some really promising uh, success. The report indicates that both detained individuals and staff found several benefits from the program. Staff explained the program participants were more effective than BOP staff at suicide watches because they took better notes uh, and interacted more frequently than staff. Um, and so I'm just wondering, can you uh, provide the committee with additional information on this program and is it promising and something that you may want to expand? Yes, thank you, Senator. So as I've traveled to more than 40 of our institutions in the last year, I've had the privilege of meeting some of these companions. And not only does the data bear that it is a productive program, but just hearing the anecdotal stories about their ability to connect better with a peer, if you will, than maybe a corrections professional would be able to do um, has been quite profound. And they take their job so seriously. So we train them. We just don't select random adults in custody. We have a really clear selection process. And then we train them like we train our staff on looking for those predictive uh, characteristics that we're looking for. And, and just to jump, jump in, and I apologize yep. interrupting because I want to try to get two more questions in and respect Senator Ossoff's time. Um, just law enforcement in general has uh, a, a real challenges with mental health and the suicide rates of law enforcement in general are 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 are, are difficult. Can you just talk about the, the BOP personnel really quick, and then I'll get my other question out on the staffing issues uh, for um, uh, correctional officers. Can you just provide uh, the committee with an update on some of the financial incentives that you've talked about before? I, I I just still find it astonishing that correctional officers are at the very bottom of all federal law enforcement. The, the amount of money they make to me is why would you, you better to go be a TSA agent or uh, jobs like that than it is uh, for in terms of the compensation? So can you address both the mental health and wellness uh, steps you're taking for correctional officers and then just those financial incentives, which seem to be urgently needed? And frankly, I think these, these incredibly hard workers need to be paid more. Thank you, Senator. Well, I certainly appreciate your passion around the mental health of our corrections professionals who are often on unsung heroes in the toughest law enforcement beat, and the data is startling. One in three have symptoms of PTSD. That means more anxiety, more depression. That means more reliance on substance abuse and higher levels of divorce. Over 90% are obese um, or in the overweight category. Over 90% 90 have hypertension or prehypertension, which means they're on the track for cardiac disease. And so the, the data is staggering. And what we're finding across the country in some places, they can leave the Federal Bureau of Prisons and work for state corrections and make two to three times more, let alone the bonuses that we're um, battling against at fast food organizations. So it is incredibly difficult. We have thrown every incentive that we can at this problem, every recruitment incentive, every retention incentive. We've increased the base salary by 2,000 for correctional officers. That's the amount of authority that I have. But the bottom line, as I said in my opening comments, is like you are referring, we need to increase that base salary. We need to pay more. And when we compare to other law enforcement, I also want to remind the committee that the average onboarding for law enforcement in this country is 21 weeks, and our officers receive about six. It's, it's, it's truly unfortunate. And I'm hoping you can answer for the record my, my second part of that question about uh, some more detailing of the financial incentives, but I, I appreciate the indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Booker. Senator Cotton, you would be next. But if you'd like a minute, Senator Ossoff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Cotton. Um, and thank you both for being here. It's a pleasure to see you both again. Director Peters, uh, following up on Senator Booker's uh, question about retention incentives, uh, at USP Atlanta, as at so many facilities, uh, there are severe staffing issues, a real difficulty recruiting and retaining staff. I had sent you a letter uh, asking that BOP undertake what efforts it could to uh, 
add retention incentives, take steps to uh, ensure that uh, those correctional officers are uh, are well paid and can be retained. And you, you've replied, which I appreciate, just like your commitment to continue working with my office to make sure that we are treating those correctional officers well, paying them properly and retaining their, their services. Thank you, Senator. I'm certainly committed to that. We have thrown every incentive that we can that's in our authority, um, rec recruitment incentives, retention incentives, and at the core of many of the issues that the Inspector General reveals is a lack of staffing. And so this is incredibly important to us. As I said in my opening comments, while the incentives have proven uh, a Band-Aid effect, we need to increase the base salary for these correctional officers so we can hire the best and the brightest and then keep them. Okay, well I'm hoping we can work together to identify some additional tools that may be available uh, for the team at USP Atlanta. Um, let's, let's remain on the, the subject of staffing. In 2021, BOP hired a contractor to develop a tool that was intended to help the Bureau determine necessary staffing levels uh, for safety at BOP facilities, correct? That's correct. And in March 2023, so a year ago, approximately, BOP reported that the tool was still being tested in three of BOP's six regions and said it would be rolled out to all six BOP regions by June of 2023. Did that happen? Uh, Senator, I'm not sure exactly when it was rolled out, but we have completed the initial uh, data analysis as it relates to those employees who are in the Correctional Services Program Division, and they are re recommending an additional 3,500 uh, uh, positions in that category going forward. And how many regions is that tool currently being used, and is it being used for USP Atlanta, for example? So I think it's important to understand that that tool is to help us plan for future budget planning and requests. It's, it won't, that tool won't help me with the crisis today because I already cannot fill the positions that you've paid for today. But in how, so, many, in how many regions is that tool currently being used? That, that 3,500 is all six. And then, Senator, the next category that they're working on right now is health services, which we have difficulty maintaining and recruiting staff in that category as well. My office, several offices on this committee have asked for a demonstration of this tool and been told that BOP won't provide it because the tool is still being refined. Can you make sure that we are uh, able to uh, view and observe and participate in a demonstration of that tool within the next several weeks? Senator, I will work with my team and see the availability and where we're at with the tool and our ability to share it with you. It, it, we're, we, don't, we can't understand why we can't see it. It doesn't make any sense. We should be able to come and see the tool. Thank you, Senator. I'll work with my team and see what we can do. Well, I hope that we can come and see it in short order. Now, I understand BOP conducted an inspection of FPC Alderson earlier this year. My team has requested a copy of that inspection report. Sounds like BOP is working on it. Do I have your commitment to get that to us promptly? Thank you, Senator. You have my commitment to work with your team to get it to you as quickly as we can. Thank you very much. Uh, Inspector General, your report has detailed how BOP staff were in some cases not carrying out key duties, including required inmate mental health assessments, counts and rounds and trainings, among others. It found that these operational failures contributed to deaths in custody. How significant a role did understaffing play in those failures? Um, I think it's a very significant problem here. It's been a challenge um, that we've seen not only in deaths, but as we've gone to prisons to inspect them. Um, and the problems that go both for correctional officers who are substantially understaffed, um, ultimately being asked to work uh, sometimes voluntarily, sometimes mandatory, overtime. Then we have augmentation, which is pulling healthcare potentially, educational staff potentially, facility staff potentially to cover the duties of the correctional officers, which has a cascading effect, meaning there are long waits for First Step Act training. Healthcare staffing can be shortages are exacerbated and things like that. So it's a big challenge. Th thank you, Inspector General. With my remaining time, Director Peters, I want to follow up on uh, an issue at USP Atlanta. Uh, as you know, a PSI investigation that I led uh, several years ago found uh, very substantial flow of contraband into the, into the facility, including weapons and narcotics. Uh, IG's recent report found that contraband drugs or weapons contributed to nearly one-third of deaths in custody. Uh, at BOP. What steps, Director, have you taken to address the flow of contraband and the threat that poses to public safety at BOP facilities, and in particular at USP Atlanta, please? 
The, at USP Atlanta, the issues that were uncovered still fall into these two categories, lack of staffing and our maintenance and repair backlog. As we were able to show you during your visit at USP Atlanta, that facility structure was crumbling and it allowed for hiding contraband uh, inside our institution. So we're working to maintain our facilities in a way where they are safe and secure, but we're also working every day uh, to interdict contraband in our institutions through the use of detecting and stopping drone activity, um, looking at the mail and looking at ways to stop drugs from coming in via the mail. We work diligently to ensure that anyone entering our institution has a background check and is physically screened before they come inside. So this is something that is absolutely top of mind as you well know and pointed out, contraband is a significant issue and can lead to lost lives or even impact the safety and security of our employees. Can, can I just speak to the contraband issue because it's such a significant issue. It's, it's connected to we found one third of the deaths um, in the, our review and in the report. Um, we've been on inspections. Um, and we were at FCI Tallahassee, for example, an inspection, and our team went, and what you saw there in terms of challenges on contraband with inmate potentially smuggling contraband. Inmates who were working near the fence lines could easily have something thrown over a fence to them. Inmates who went out to collect garbage were not being checked as they brought bags back into the facility. Some basic stuff that you would think, it's not sophisticated to, to figure out how to try and interdict those kind, that kind of contraband. Um, and not surprisingly, by the way, the prison with the highest number of deaths in our report was USP Atlanta, which had been closed in 2021 precisely because of the hundreds of, uh, the, the dozens of cell phones and drugs found in the prison. Um, and so um, this is a major problem. We've had a staff search policy recommendation open for years that has not been implemented, a basic search policy for staff coming in uh, to the facility that hasn't happened either. So there, there are a lot of challenges on the contraband issue that are very significant that we're concerned is contributing to inmate deaths, both from homemade weapons and from drugs being in, brought into the facility. Thank you both. Thank you. Senator Cotton. Director Peters, um, the Inspector General noted in his statement for today's hearing that solving the Bureau's staffing shortage is, quote, one of the building blocks to begin to address the chronic challenges facing the BOP. He also said that significant staffing shortages have had a, quote, cascading effect on your Bureau's facilities. Um, when you testified six months ago, I asked you how many correctional officer positions were filled. You didn't have an answer. At the time, last month, you did an interview with 60 Minutes. You also didn't have an answer. Do you have an answer today for how many correctional officers you currently have on payroll? Yes, Senator. We have almost 40,000 authorized positions across the organization, and 14,899 of those are correctional officers. We are going to 100% fund those positions. They are only 82% filled at this time. 14,899 are correctional officers. Yes, correctional and, officers. The individuals that you would yes. think in your mind are on the units safeguarding our adults. Um, and, and you said 40,000. Is that your, that's your total personnel, right? That's our total What personnel. are you authorized and funded for by Congress for correctional officers? For correctional officers, we are authorized at that 14,899 number, and it's 100% funded. Um, are you sure you're not authorized around tw about 20,000? 20, 20,000 is the correctional officer series position. That's 20,466. That includes correctional officers, lieutenant, correctional services officers, which are in our receiving and discharging unit. And also that number includes correctional counselors. Okay. Um, 14,899 is what you have today. Um, do you know what you had six months ago? 
Uh, no, Senator, I don't have that number. Do you know how many you how many new officers have been hired over the last six months? New correctional officers. I know that we've made pro uh, progress in the last year. We have mo moved our overall uh, recruitment and retention from 87 percent last year to 90 percent. We moved our correctional officer. Um, fill from the from the 70s into 82 about 82 percent now okay um in 2022 the congress passed a law requiring that your employees spend 90 percent of their time on their primary responsibility so a correctional officer spends 90 percent of his time being a correctional officer an hvac technician spends 90 percent of his time doing hvac work um, the bureau hasn't complied with that law to my knowledge um, six months ago when you were here I asked uh, how much time your employees are spending on average on their primary responsibility. You didn't have an answer. Do you have an answer for that today? I do, Senator, and it's different in every institution. In some of our institutions, we'll take um, USP Thompson right now. Because we've been able to lower the number of, uh, lower the mission, we needed fewer employees, and so we're not relying on augmentation and overtime. When you look at Brooklyn, we are relying on it substantially because of the lack of staffing. Many of my officers are working 16 hours regularly, and we're having to engage in augmentation on a daily basis at that institution which as you well know, while those psychologists or teachers whom, whomever is being augmented is fully trained and prepared to do that work, it also means that they're not able to do their current job as you're alluding to. Yeah. Um, so I, I take your point that you, you, you could average across all of your facilities, but that average is not particularly meaningful because each facility is its own world and a facility that is well balanced is going to have everyone doing 90 percent of their job whether it's hvac or teacher or counselor or correctional officer another facility might be unbalanced and rely heavily on augmentation and overtime is that right that's correct okay. senator and in those facilities where they we are fully staffed or more full staff. We've just given clear direction to those wardens to begin over hiring so that if they're in an economy where we're actually able to bring in correctional officers, we'll hire them and then we'll TDY them to some of these other institutions that are in more dire straits. Okay, but based on your answer, I assume you know the answer on a facility by facility basis. You have that data available to you? That's correct, Senator. Is that data public in any of your published reports? I will have to check on that and see. If it's not, if it is, please send us the link. If it's not, could we get those that data for? We will work with your committee? staff to Thank see you. what we can share. Yes, Senator. Um, talk. I want to talk briefly about challenges staffing up. Your correctional officers start out at uh, the GS five salary level, making forty eight thousand a year. Um, my understanding is they can top out at seventy four thousand a year. By contrast, border patrol officers can start as high as 68,000 and they can top out at 113,000 even without becoming a supervisor. Uh, does the Bureau have trouble competing with the pay of other federal law enforcement agencies? It's great trouble competing with other law enforcement agencies. I'll um, pick on Brooklyn again. As we look at state corrections in New York, individuals can make two or three times more working for the New York City Corrections Department than the Federal Bureau of Prisons. So even after we issued a 35% uh, retention bonus at Brooklyn, that allows someone after a few years to be making $90,000 a year for state corrections in the same uh, time period to be making about $130,000 a year. Okay. Um, in the last major appropriations bill that Congress passed uh, in December 2022, Congress asked the Bureau uh, to consider increasing pay to match those other agencies and asked for a review to be submitted uh, no later than last June. Has that review been submitted yet? Senator, I don't know. I can check. I will tell you that this year I was able to the, increase the base salary of correctional officers by 2000 I didn't have the authority to go beyond that. Okay. Uh, please do and, and get back to us. Um, one final point, since you and Mr. Horowitz both raised it about contraband uh, in prisons. Um, I think like maybe the most dangerous kind of contraband in prisons is cell phones. Cell phones aren't going to kill anyone themselves, but they enable the commission of many other heinous crimes in prison. That's one reason why I've introduced the Cell Phone Jamming Reform Act, which would make it clear to state prisons um, that they can use targeted jamming to block cell phone signals in prison housing units. Um, we've had some resistance from the telecom industry. I wish they would come to their senses on this issue, but uh, Ms. Peters, have you conducted pilot programs 
uh, in your facilities on micro jamming and managed access systems? We have, Senator, at a variety of our institutions, both in terms of detection and jamming, both prove very successful. What my employees are telling me is the detection versus the jamming is the most helpful because then we can investigate, figure out who actually has it, who brought it in, and solve the greater flow of the contraband problem. Okay, and Mr. Horowitz, since you addressed the issue, would you like to make any comment on cell phones in yeah. prisons based on your work? The senator, couldn't agree more. I, I often say a cell phone in a prison is a deadly weapon. Um, we investigated a murder for hire carried out on a federal correctional officer in Guanabo, Puerto Rico, where the hit was put on by someone in the prison. And one of the things I've asked for, and I'd be happy to work with you, Senator, on this, Smuggling a cell phone into a prison is a federal misdemeanor. It's not a felony. And that, I was surprised by that, frankly. I, having been in AUSA for many years, I assumed, of course, it had to be um, a uh, felony. It isn't. Um, and what we found, by the way, I'm going to tie contraband to sexual assault. As you know, we have a major problem with sexual assaults in prison, not just on female inmates obviously on female inmates, but also on male inmates. And one of the things we found is that contraband is used to groom inmates. It's the way to gain favor by a correctional officer or a BOP employee. It's not just correctional officer, BOP employee to gain favor. We prosecuted a chaplain in a federal facility in New Hampshire for bringing in contraband cell phones and other items. So. Uh, that is something, we shouldn't have to make the bribery case, which is what we have to do to bring the felony charge, as you know as a former prosecutor. Um, that's what we strive to do. It, but finding the person with the contraband, it's a lot easier to make those cases. We get a lot more prosecuted and get a lot of, uh, of the very small fraction of BOP staff who are engaged in misconduct out. Because the other thing I know, I met with President White the other day. Um, the, the, I know this from my time as a prosecutor in New York where I prosecuted some cor corrupt police officers. There is not a single BOP employee who wants to work next to a corrupt employee or a dangerous inmate, right, who's creating, cr engaging in crimes. So we all have to focus on that. All right. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cotton. I think there's some valuable suggestions for legislation, and I'm happy to work on a bipartisan basis to see if we can uh, move some of those forward. I'd like to ask, uh, be more specific, we've talked about staffing in so many different re respects, and I'm sure Senator Booker will address many of them this afternoon. But I'd like, I'd like to zero in on the health staff, because it appears that this is one of the real deficiencies. And what we've identified as we go forward through the reports is that identifying potentially suicidal individuals, which takes some expertise in mental health, managing medication, mental health treatment, is going to call for certain specialty uh, training or education. Uh, let me ask Director Peters, what has been your luck in recruiting people in those categories? It's been a challenge, and as you and I have discussed before, we have to consider ourselves a healthcare organization. So many of our people come to us with severe mental health issues, and they are 10 years older biologically than their chronological age based on the lack of preventative health care and lifestyle choices. So we have a sick population, and recruiting and retaining medical professionals is incredibly difficult. I have visited some of our institutions where health services was half filled. Um, and we're having to TDY people uh, across the country. So we're doing a variety of things. We're leaning into telehealth in order to ensure more quality care. Our recruitment for medical professionals, we just approved a 25% recruit recruitment incentives. We have individual incentives across the country for doctors that said they were going to leave, um, psychologists that said they were going to leave. And so we're doing everything in our authority. But I will tell you that doctors, in our care can leave and make almost double what they're making for us in the community. And so this is something that is that we're working on. This is something that is very troubling, um, but we have to figure out, again, like I said with correctional officers, how to increase the base pay for our medical professionals so that we can provide the quality care we need to provide. Are you familiar with the National Health Service Corps? Yes. Are there... 
applicants to for jobs in Bureau of Prisons who are going to have an opportunity for loan forgiveness if they take those jobs? Senator, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm happy to look into it and get back to you. I want to look into it as well. I think we have to... General Horowitz, do you have any thoughts on that? I don't know the answer, but I think it is something that's important to look into. We've also noted the importance of the public health service professionals and, and considering how to bring more well, of those... I think I think if we're looking for incentives to bring in healthcare professionals, and they're certainly needed, they're needed so many different places, but they're needed in the Bureau of Prisons, the incentive of loan forgiveness may make a difference. At least we ought to try it. I also want to, want to say that I'd go out on a limb and, and believe that at the federal level, we have so many areas where we need healthcare professionals that uh, we ought to think more seriously about some type of program that is federally inspired, that results in a work, workforce that is absolutely needed at this point. Uh, Senator Welch, I, do you need a minute more to adjust to the circumstances, or are you ready? Uh, uh, th I thank you uh, for... Uh, I'm recognizing you. Keeping it. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. And uh, Director Peters, it's, uh, it's good to see you. Uh, we talked about the situation in Vermont where we don't have a residential uh, reentry facility. It's a really serious issue. Um, as you know, individuals with 12 months or less on their sentence are eligible for, to transfer to that residential facility. Uh, it really makes a big difference. They can receive assistance with housing, treatment, unemployment. Uh, and it's been proven, as you know, to reduce recidivism. And Vermont... This is really pretty shocking to me and to Senator Sanders and to Congresswoman Ballant. Vermont is one of only two states that does not have uh, the benefit of that facility. Hawaii being the other one, and they have one, and I think they're looking to get another, get a replacement. And I know that when we spoke about this, uh, you had indicated that we were gonna get one, but you clarified that you misspoke, uh, and it was gonna be a reporting facility instead. Reporting facility is not worth it. Uh, reporting would mean that people have to go to Providence, Rhode Island, it's a long way from Burlington, or they'd have to go to Manchester, New Hampshire, very, very long way, or maybe Boston. Uh, so it just doesn't do the job. Um, and I think it, uh, after you clarified that, you indicated that if the Vermont delegation researched the matter and determined that a residential facility was necessary, you might change course. And we did our research, and uh, most prominently among them, we checked with the attorneys, and most importantly with, uh, with our federal uh, judges. And uh, Chairman Dermott, I ask unanimous consent to be able to submit a letter uh, to Director Peters into the record. Without objection. Um, so we were surprised, this is the delegation, when we got a letter from the Bureau of Prisons on Friday indicated that you planned uh, to, to proceed against our consensus uh, and uh, not provide this residential uh, treatment facility. As I mentioned, our office did speak to the stakeholders, including the Chief Judge Craw Crawford, uh, and he wrote to you in December expressing his strong belief that Vermont absolutely, absolutely needs a reentry center. And Chairman Durbin, I request uh, permission to submit his letter into the record. Without objection. And in his letter, he wrote, the chief judge, that the lack of a facility in Vermont interferes with every pro-social activity necessary to return to normal life, including the long-term employment, connecting with family, and locating housing. And Chief Justice Crawford added, our judges all believe, our judge." Our judges all believe that opening a residential reentry center in Vermont is a significant step towards the improvement of public safety and rehabilitation. And the chief judge attached a report from the chief probation officer further outlining the need for a center. And we've heard this from our attorneys, both in the defense and the prosecution side. And I understand you've received this letter. So what's the deal? How do we get our residential reentry uh, program in Vermont so that we're not essentially the only state in the country that doesn't have the opportunity to provide the benefit of these services to people who really need them. 
Well, thank you, Senator. Well, first off, thank you for the conversations we've had around this table and individually, one-on-one, -on -one around this issue. I am always happy to take in new information. No, let's get to the point. We haven't received, and I will get to the point, Senator. So our market analysis determined that since there are so few individuals releasing back to Vermont, that it's not financially feasible for a residential reentry center. And we're actually really optimistic about the day reporting center. The day reporting center will provide all of the wraparound services so that a residential reentry center will. I don't think you've will. provided the Marcus study to us to take a look at. Senator, I can work with your team and mine to see what we can share with you around that study. Well, you know, I don't understand about the Marcus study. We've got the probation officers, we've got the, the judges in the district saying, hey, we need this. And why is it that Vermont would be the only one state in the entire nation along with Hawaii temporarily, that doesn't have it. I mean, why do we need a market study? We've got defendants, we've got judges, we've got the need. Senator, again, it's all around resources and trying to balance the well, resources that's a different that question. we have. That's a different um, question. If you're saying the market study says we don't need it as much as New York City, maybe that's right. But we need it in Vermont. That's what I'm saying. And every other state has it, basically, and we don't. Senator, again, I'm happy to take any new information that you have and look at it. Of course, uh, we, but we do feel confident in our decision around the day reporting center that it's going to be able right. to help uh, it, more we, people. We've got to Vermont. work on this more. I mean, th there are two totally different things. A reentry center provides resources to people when they're coming back into society. The reporting center, they're going down, you know, it's a long way. There's no follow through. You don't get the resources. And it's just astonishing to Senator Sanders, to Congresswoman Ballant, and to me that somehow this market study says Vermont is unique in that we don't need or deserve or should have the benefit of the same services that are provided in every other state in this great country of ours. Uh, Senator, again, happy to have further conversation. We are optimistic right. about you the Just be clear, center. I'll talk to you, but what we want is a reentry center, and that's what our chief judge is saying we need. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Welch. Senator yeah. Grassley. Yeah. Ms. Peters, uh, would the Bureau of Prisons let cor cor correctional officers supervise adult inmates if the officer hadn't successfully cleared an FBI National Crime Information Center background and fingerprint check? Uh, Senator, it's my understanding that our policies and practices require that background check prior to employment. Well, if that's the case, I'd like to say something not just for you, but for my colleagues. If folks who haven't passed an FBI ground, uh, background check aren't allowed to supervise adults, we shouldn't give them custody of unaccompanied alien children. However, the Office of Refugee uh, Resettlement doesn't require FBI background checks for all sponsors and it refuses to give law enforcement information on the sponsors, even if the child's well-being is in question, it seems to me this would have to stop, and I hope this committee brings in more witnesses on this subject and takes up meaningful legislation to protect our kids. Mr. Horowitz, I'm going to take uh, advantage of you being here to ask a follow-up question. I wrote you on November the 2nd last year about your review of the Justice Department obtaining phone records of members of Congress and staff. In response, uh, you said your report will likely cover most, if not all, of the eight categories of information that I asked for. It, it's been said that the Justice Department obtained these records to investigate alleged leaks related to the discredited Crossfire Hurricane investigation. But I'm concerned that the Justice Department used this as an excuse to keep tabs on Congress as we conducted oversight of the department relating to the uh, crossfire hurricane. Can you provide an update on the scope of your review and when you expect to issue your findings? And uh, second question re related to this is, did the Justice Department apply the same investigative standards to its agents and staff or other officials in the executive branch who may have leaked uh, the information, as did members of Congress and our staff. Uh, thank you, Senator. And um, I'll give you an update on timing and where we are. We are planning to cover, as I said in my letter to you, the issues that you referenced and the categories we 
spoke about there. Um, we are actually in the process of drafting uh, the report. Um, so um, we will hopefully be able to get out in a reasonable amount of time. I will just add, because so much of these issues to cover highly classified information, as you know from our prior reviews, um, we have to go through the department and the various intelligence community processes to get it to the oh. point where we can issue it. So I, I, only, I always put that caveat on any reports we have that involve classified information. But we are working to get it done. We've made good progress. Um, and the, the second question you raised, the issue you addressed, is one that we're also assessing. They, they, do, they do exactly the same thing for their own staff? As, as we're, we're, that's one of the issues we're assessing, and we will report on that, Senator. Okay. Uh, Director Peters, in February 2024, Justice Department's Inspector General report on deaths in the Bureau of Prisons facilities found the FCC Hazelton had 14 deaths from 2014 to 2021. Last year, September 12th, 23, I, along with Chairman Durbin, Senators Manchin, and Capito, wrote to you about additional allegations of serious misconduct occur, uh, occurring at FCC Hazelton. Uh, some of the allegations include prison staff falsifying records involving releasing the wrong inmate prison escapes, uh, inmate medical asse assessment, time attendance sheets, and staff's physical assaulting uh, inmates. So do you, uh, you've yet to respond to our letter. Why not? And what are you doing to straighten out the significant problems at Hazelton that we've thought, uh, that we brought to your attention? Thank you, Senator. Well, we take all of those allegations very seriously, and when we learn that someone has not done the job that we've required of them, we investigate it and hold them accountable. Hazelton, like many of our institutions, is suffering from a lack of staffing. Um, we are having difficulty recruiting and retaining there. One of the things that we have done recently is we've actually closed down a unit in order to deploy staff to the rest of the institution. And so, like I said earlier, uh, recruitment and retention is uh, crisis at the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and Hazelton is not alone in that problem. Is the problem that I brought to your attention entirely related to the number of people you have on staff and nothing else? Senator, I think it's a variety of things. We talked about contraband and having to tackle the very serious issues of contraband inside our institutions. As you look at the older facility of Hazelton and the maintenance repair backlog, I think that can add to it. I think we also have to talk a lot about um, the work that the Inspector General and I have been working on to clear up our backlogged investigations, the number of staff that we've added to our Office of Internal Affairs. When I started, there were less than 30 employees in that office, and now we're looking at almost 150 with direct oversight directly to central office in order to not only shore up that backlog, but to hold people accountable in a swift, swift and sure fashion. Thanks to both of you for answering my questions. Thanks, Senator Grassley. I believe Senator Kennedy is, still has a first round opportunity, and I understand Senators Booker and Ossoff would like a second round opportunity. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, how are you? I'm doing well. Good to Good. see you again, I'm Senator. A, I'm a big fan. Uh, director Peters, uh, you're the director of the Bureau of Prisons, is that right? That's correct, sir. Uh, you came from, you used to run the correction system in Oregon, right? That's correct. Yeah. Oregon um, legalized drugs, is that right? That's correct. You're, Oregon's about to reverse that. Is that correct? Senator, I'm not familiar with the policy proposed to reverse that. Oh, you've just ignored Oregon? Oregon still has a very special place in my heart, sir. Okay. You, you haven't read any of the articles about the reversal? I haven't, Senator. You don't know anything about it? Correct, sir. Okay. Wow. Um, you're in charge of implementing the First Step Act, Director? That's correct. How many criminals have you released under the First Step Act? Um, so, first step back for the overall release since the initiation of the um, uh, first step act is, I have that exact number in front of me. Um, 
You don't know off the top of your head? Sorry, Senator. Um, so 70% of those that were released, uh, we have about 30,000 individuals that have been released since the passage of the First Step Act. All right, so you've released 30,000 criminals under the First Step Act. Okay. And how many of them, when you, when, before you released them, did you contact any of their victims to say we're about to let this guy out? Uh, Senator, it's my understanding that that notification happens through the U.S. Attorney's Office, but I will check into that and get back to you. You don't know? Senator, I don't. You ha have you followed up with the U.S. Attorneys to say, do you have a system to say, hey, we're about to let this guy out. Would you, you know, we want to be sure the victim's contacted? As a former victim's advocate, I share that value, that victim notification should happen. I'll check on the process. But you don't know you. if it's happening. That's correct, Senator. Wow. Okay, of the 30,000 criminals you let free, how many of them have come back? Have uh, committed a crime again, hurt somebody else? So that number is one that we're still looking at um, as it relates to the recidivism rate for those that were released on the First Step Act. You don't have any idea? No, Senator. You don't have anybody at the Bureau that can count? I do not have that number in front of me today. So let me Senator. get this straight. The First Step Act was passed in 2018. This is 2024, am I right so far? That's correct. That's six years. And in six years, you've let 30,000 criminals go, right? That's correct. And you don't have the slightest idea how many of them committed another crime and came back? I don't have that number in front of me today, And you sir. run the Bureau of Prisons? That's correct. And how many employees do you have? About 40,000 employees. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. General? I know you got a lot to do, but could you give us a hand here and let's find out whether the First Step Act worked and how many, if we've released 30,000 criminals after six years, our director here doesn't know how many have, 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 have committed another crime and come back. Can you help us? Um, Senator, I can certainly follow up on that issue. I will s just say in terms of work we've done in the past, for example, on compassionate release and going to the Bureau of Prisons, this is before Director Peters was there, and asking them for data on compassionate release because that was one of the issues no, that has come up. How, it, excuse how me for interrupting, but I'm yep. not talking about compassionate release. No, I, I understand. You know, my colleague saying, said we were told that that it would save money and it would be in the interest of public safety to release criminals from prison. I didn't vote for it, but the, the majority rules. And so Congress did it. And Ms. Peters, Director Peters at the Bureau of Prisons, and her colleagues released 30,000 criminals, all of whom are there for a reason, okay? They, they didn't just go to prison for a free, free toaster. They were there for a reason. And so her department let them go, and after six years, we don't have the slightest idea, not a single one of the 40,000 of her employees know how many have committed a second crime and come back. So how the hell are we supposed to figure out whether it worked? Uh, Senator, Your people ought to hide I, their head in a bag, Director, that you can't come here in front of this Congress and answer that question. I'm sorry. I interrupted you with my speech. No, that's okay. I was just going to, you know, my bottom line point on it was uh, I've often looked to those questions on things like compassionate release and other programs. And one of the challenges we found is the department just doesn't have good data on that. Halfway houses. Congress is spending about a half a billion dollars a year on halfway houses. There's really not great recidivism data on that either. Well, How well we, are they we, working? We, before we do this, we need to find out. Look, I believe in justice. I believe in treating everybody fairly, but there are people out there. I don't know why. If I make it to heaven, I'm going to ask. They're not mixed up. They're not confused. They're not sick. It's not that their mama or daddy didn't love them or not enough. They just hurt other people, and they take other people's stuff, and we have to separate them from society. And the director let 30,000 of these folks go and can't tell me today how many have come back. I just, I just find it takes my breath away with 40,000 people. 
How many of your 40,000 people are actually coming to work or are still working from home, director? Uh, the super majority of our employees come to work every day because we're running 24-7 what, what percentage are coming to work every day? I, I, the percentage is quite high. I don't have the exact You don't number, know? But the super, well, maybe there's your problem. The super majority of our individuals come to work If they're not work coming to work, they can't, they, can't, they can't give us the answer. I've, I've gone over. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. This, but, is, this, is why people, this is why people hate government and don't trust government. So I'd like to respond concerning the Grassley-Durbin First Step Act signed into law by President Donald Trump. I thought Trump, you might have a response. By President Donald Trump. I almost want to repeat that because this notion that it's soft on crime, uh, I don't consider Chuck Grassley soft on crime. I don't consider Donald Trump soft on crime. Let me tell you the numbers, the numbers that we have. Some 30,000 released. The recidivism rate for people released under the First Step Act is 12.4%. Seven out of every eight individuals released under the law have not been rearrested re or charged with a new crime. By comparison, DOJ estimates that in the decade before the First Step Act was passed, 43% of the people formerly incarcerated in BOP were rearrested within three years of their release. Is the First Step Act working? I would submit it is. Would you yield for a question, Mr. Chair? When I finish. I'm sorry. The point Excuse I'm, me for interrupting. The point I'm making is we decided with the Trump administration and Senator Grassley's leadership that we were going to take a different approach to releasing people from prison. We would give them an opportunity to be trained, educated, skilled, in many ways more prepared for release because 80%, I believe, in the system are going to be released someday. We don't want to commit another crime or create another victim. I would submit this is a success. Don't put your head in a bag or whatever Senator suggested. Stand up tall and try to make it better, and I'm ready to do that. But the First Step Act was a constructive reform of the penal system, and I think it was a good idea and stand by it. I'll su submit to your question. Thank you, and I appreciate, as usual, Dick, you make good points. Here's my point. I didn't vote for the First Step Act because I was afraid this was gonna happen. Um, and what I hear you saying uh, is that uh, of the 30,000 that the director released, over 3,000 committed another crime in her back. Here's my question. How come you know that and she doesn't? Because she's probably looking for And the 40,000 people at Bureau of Prisons who are supposed to give us this information don't know. Well, I'd like to say in all fairness, she's under oath, and I think when you ask for numbers, she wants to make sure she tells you a number she can live with. I have this information. I think it's probably close to being 100% accurate, but I wouldn't say under oath it is. So I think give her a fair opportunity to respond. I mean, it just not, might, might not be the type of thing that comes but, rolling but you're off not the tongue. The, you're, it's not your job, and I appreciate the information, and I'd like to see the study that shows that. I just don't understand why the director has no idea. Well, she didn't say she was uncertain, and she wanted to be, go back and check. She said, I don't know. And I just find that extraordinary. I'm assuming since she's under oath that it's an honest answer. We have two other individuals who are seeking a second uh, round. I believe Senator Booker is first. I hate to distract from my uh, questions, um, but I just want to defend the bipartisan work that we all uh, did. 86 senators voted for it. And the dramatic drop in recidivism rates uh, that is not the Bureau of Prisons' job to track. It's the Justice Department's job to track it. Um, is stunning. I mean, this has literally saved the United States of America hundreds of millions of dollars. It has lowered crime. The data shows we max people out in prison, don't prepare them. You can't keep them by law. So when people max out and don't have halfway houses, don't have the kind of resources that uh, people that were released during this have, their recidivism rates are through the charts. So we have to be smart on crime. And one of the biggest growths of bureaucracy I've seen in my life was a, is a prison industrial complex in the United States of America, and it's not making us safer. So I understand that. And then the second thing, in your defense, I, the mission of the BOP is not to, to, to necessarily uh, track folks after they're gone. I, from my, what I understand, having done a lot of reading and prep for a later hearing, that's not your mission. Your mission is to hold them securely, prepare them 
programs, whole, so so forth. So the if we want to get the the uh, Senator Kennedy, if we want to get the head of the Justice Department, I'm all for grilling them. But you're you're one of these folks that we're giving you too little resources to do too much work, and and that's what I'd like to jump into. And I I have a lot of frustrations, obviously, with what's going on. But I've watched you now as a professional struggle mightily uh, to meet the demands uh, that are put on you in a moment where Congress is not giving you the resources necessary to do your job even, in facilities that are outrageously decrepit. I mean, you, you, your FY22 is estimated that the BOP needs $2 billion in funding to repair facilities, but the BOP, this is my challenge to you, has requested $200 million for infrastructure repairs. Congress allocated $59 million, but is it not true that people are dying in your facilities because there's no air conditioning. Senator, your uh, data points around the maintenance and repair backlog are absolutely spot on, and that number has grown since we last reported that $2 billion. It is now closer to $3 billion because uh, we continue to have roofs uh, that are crumbling. We continue to have HVACs that have stopped working. And if you look at the amount of money that we typically get from Congress, it's about $100,000 a year to solve that $3 billion problem. And the cost of one roof replacement alone is a million dollars. Yeah, and I just point this out to say again, this is a, a pattern here. Your employees could literally leave your job and not make 10% more, 20% more, but 100% more and not have to work hour, and you know this, and I'm gonna bring this out in the hearing later on today, when you have to hold somebody over on a shift, what does that do to a family suddenly where they can't pick up their kids for school? Senator, I hear it all the time when I'm walking the halls of our institutions. It isn't just the physical wear and tear and mental wear and tear of that overtime and augmentation, it is what impacts their family. Yeah, I talked to the Capitol Police when we had them working, held over on shifts, they just weren't allowed to leave and now suddenly their whole family is in crisis. That's right, we hear all the time. They had their week planned out on who was picking the kids up from daycare, who was cooking, and the Federal Bureau of Prisons messes with that schedule day in and day out for our families. Yeah, and we preach how much we support law enforcement. This is utterly shameful. Um, a February 2024 GEO report found that by October 2023, the BOP housed approximately 8% of its prison po population in solitary confinement. One of the things I, I'd like for you to address is the report noted significant racial disparities with black individuals comprising less than half, 38% of the total federal prison population, but represented over half, 59% of those in solitary. Can you address that for me? Yes, Senator, and this is an issue that's been studied across the country, both in federal corrections and in state corrections. And often what we find is the level of gang activity that happens inside our institutions often drives that number. That's still unacceptable to me. I think we have so much work to do in restrictive housing reform, and we have to ask those hard questions about um, the disproportionate number of individuals of minority status who are in restrictive housing. Yeah, and I'm hoping that's something that my, my staff uh, can, can, can work with you on um, as well. And then the final thing I just want to say is the, the, um, the, the, the chairman said it. There, I think there's room for a lot of bipartisan work here to try to address these issues. Um, the, the, the shamefulness of what's happening as a result of the lack of funding for facilities, for personnel, and for certain position light items. Um, is, is outrageous uh, implications of the United States of America and its support of law enforcement officers and, and creating inhumane conditions in prisons. The one thing I, uh, the very small point to the Inspector General that was brought out, um, and I want to talk to Senator Cotton, who I'm going to be sitting with, uh, chairing and uh, is a ranking on this committee, is this idea of the inability to jam cell phone signals. Um, I, and, and the fact that it's a misdemeanor to bring in something that you said under oath is a, uh, a tantamount to a deadly weapon. And, and I'm wondering, number one, on the jamming issue, the only pushback my staff can say that they get is the, the need for public, federal public defenders when meeting with their client to be able to access the internet. Is there a workaround that you see to that uh, concern? And then number two, um, is, is the, do you think it would be enough of a, a deterrent if it was suddenly not a misdemeanor but a felony? 
Um, yes, Senator. I think on both those issues, there's certainly a workaround. I think one of the issues, um, I think Senator Cotton had it right, the FCC and the technology companies have opposed it or raised concerns about it in part because of the inability, on a, I think, and Director Peters can speak to this as well, to limit the jamming or limit the interference to the grounds itself of the facility as opposed to some of the perimeter areas, particularly where there are homes nearby. And so I think there are that are some of the, those are some of the issues that have been at issue here. But many state prisons have been doing this for years. California has been involved in jamming technology. We've done work in this space, our office, over the years, and have seen other states successfully do it. So it's clearly doable. We're glad to see the BOP moving forward. But there are some uh, areas they have to be careful about. And, and but but the misdemeanor to the to the felony. But the misdemeanor. Let, 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 yeah. I mean, if somebody is caught sneaking a cell phone in, they're fired, right? They lose their job. Is that not enough that, of a Well, here, here's the issue. Um, uh, from a union standpoint, if they're a union member, there is an ability to um, litigate that question on a misdemeanor. A felony charge, if someone's convicted of a felony charge, my understanding is they're out. My understanding is if it's a misdemeanor or never prosecuted and is you know, if, there are, if it's only a misdemeanor, federal prosecutors are not taking these cases. So no one's getting prosecuted for a misdemeanor, right? There's lots of felonies to be prosecuted. So the problem is they're not being prosecuted, and that leaves it to the BOP's administrative process only to deal with the problem. Yes. And that sometimes does not, as I understand it, result in removal of individuals and I have multiple examples, I'm happy to come speak to your staff about them and to you as well, where we have had cases involving sexual assaults that were the result of some grooming food, bringing in foods of misdemeanor. Well, think about how that's an enticement to female inmates, potentially, and a okay. grooming tool. And, it and just, just shouldn't happen. No, I agree with you. And, and not to be a little lighthearted on this, but I want you to clarify for the record, when you say that nobody is prosecuted for federal misdemeanors, right. that's not an invitation to anybody on this dais correct. to commit misdemeanors. It's, I, I am, you, you are correct. Yeah. And, I, and there are a, rare occasions where there are misdemeanor charges brought, but almost every U.S. Attorney's Office in the country has lots of felony cases. Okay, because Senator extent. Durbin's staff, I just want to make sure they heard that. They should not <laughs> do federal misdemeanors. Thank you, sir. Thanks for the help, Senator. <laughs> Senator Rossoff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the uh, second opportunity. Um, on this point about disciplinary procedures, it's the Office of Internal Affairs at BOP that handles investigations, internal investigations of staff misconduct, correct, Director? That's correct. As soon as we, we refer all allegations yeah. to the Office of the Inspector General, once they review and determine that there's nothing criminal in nature, then they kick it back to us and we engage in the administrative investigation. So let's, let's update on the OIA backlog. Uh, PSI investigation a couple years ago into the sexual assault of female inmates in BOP facilities found that there was about 8,000 backlogged cases at OIA. And at that time, about two years ago, BOP told us that it would take about two years to clear the backlog. BOP just provided to my office an update that there are still over 7,300 pending cases before OIA. So that's about a 7% reduction. You said publicly, I think in a CBS interview last month, that it would take about two years to clear the OIA backlog. So two years ago, BOP said two years to clear the backlog. This year, BOP says two years to clear the backlog. Why and when will it be cleared? Thank you, Senator. So um, I, too, share your frustration in the time it's taking to clear the backlog, but it hasn't been for lack of a plan. So as I shared with you, we had just under 30 employees in the Office of Internal Affairs. And since you and I last spoke, it simply took us until last fall to get those positions filled. And so now we're at about 150 individuals who are in the Office of Internal Affairs who report directly to headquarters so that there's that centralized oversight that you wanted. Um, 
Um, we now have them fully trained, and we're just starting to see a chip uh, down of that backlog. But we're not just looking at the backlog. We're looking at other ways to clear the backlog by looking at, um, as an example, how many of these investigations could actually be handled at a lower level, at the warden level. If you have an employee that comes in and is five minutes late, you're considered AWOL. That AWOL gets kicked to the Office of Internal Affairs. We're asking the question, does that really need to be investigated by a special investigative agent at headquarters, or is that something the warden can handle, and then would it be more swift and sure action? So I'm glad to hear you've added capacity and personnel, and you're looking at changing procedures. So when, when, when will it be cleared? So I asked for that exact update before this hearing because I knew you would ask, and the answer is we are hoping to have it cleared within the next two years. Two years. Well, I hope this is the last time that it'll be, again, two years, but I do appreciate the effort that you've clearly invested into uh, trying to rectify this. Getting back Thank to you. some of the staffing issues and staff compensation and, and retention incentives, and again, I hope that we can work together to find additional tools for retention and recruitment at USP Atlanta in particular. But we've been talking about how BOP personnel are underpaid and they can't, you know, you can't compete in this labor market against other law enforcement agencies. We talk about health staff. So how much more do they need to be paid? Thank you, Senator. So right now we have about 45% of our employees receiving some storm some form of incentive, and what we're finding in communities like New York, the New York Department of Corrections, you can get paid two or three times more for working for them. So the answer varies depending on where our facilities are um, and what issues we're faced with. In rural areas, we're faced with just having saturated the market, and we've hired everybody that lives in those areas. Um, in, the in the urban areas, we're competing, as I said earlier, with fast food chains and grocery stores. So understand that these labor markets are regional. Let let's try it this way. How much more in the next fiscal year does BOP need to be appropriated in order to resolve the fact that you can't currently offer competitive salaries. What's the number? Thank you, Senator. I don't have that number today, but we're looking at proposing a new salary rate, um, salary rate table, and so my HR team is working on that data right now. So we will have that during our so, next and, and, budget ask. You know, and what concerns me is, you know, you've got to go to DOJ, and then DOJ has to go to OMB and justify your annual budget request, and OMB is going to come back and say, well, why do you need this many more hundreds of millions or billions of dollars? for personnel, and if you can't justify that through some rigorous demonstration, some rigorous analysis, then, then your request for the PBR is gonna get denied. So, so for the next presidential budget cycle, are you gonna have a specific number, a specific appropriation that you need from the Congress that's backed up by rigorous analysis in order to resolve this competitive salaries issue? We hope to have that number not just in the recruitment and retention category, but the other main crisis issue around maintenance and repair backlog. Okay, I'm just out of, my, la my last point was just, you know, I mentioned earlier my team's trying to look at this, uh, this staffing tool. I can't, you know, w the, the Senate Judiciary Committee accesses a lot of sensitive information. We conduct a lot of rigorous oversight. We're asking to come and review a tool that you use to determine staffing levels. Racking my brain sitting here, I can't think of any reason why your Office of Legislative Affairs would deny my staff and members of this committee the opportunity to view how that tool functions. I can't think of any reason at all. So. We need to get our teams together, get in the room, look at the tool, see how it works, okay? Thank you, Senator. I've said again and again, we want to be as transparent in po as possible. I suspect the reason is that it's still a work in progress. Well, we can, look at, a work, we, we can look at works in progress. I'm happy to have this conversation with you. We've even talked around the executive team if we would be able to, once the product is completed, have it be an outward facing product so that the public could even see it. That's still being deliberated by um, individuals inside our organization, but I'm happy yeah, to work. Please Senator. just let my team have a look. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Ossoff. And I want to thank uh, all the members who participated in this hearing today. Uh, I've made this uh, a special item in the agenda of the committee to focus on corrections. Because I felt for a long time that we're fast and loose when it comes to sentencing and criminal uh, procedure and the like. Uh, and we ought to see what happens next for those who are, in fact, convicted 
is, and are incarcerated as a result of it. Uh, historically, I know some great people have had things to say about corrections. One of them I quoted before was Nelson Mandela, who himself spent 18 years in prison on Robben Island uh, in South Africa and then went on to be elected president of his country. But he said, no one truly knows a nation until one has been inside its jails. A nation should not be judged on how it treats its highest citizens, but its lowest ones. The purpose of this hearing was to make it clear that a federal prison sentence should never be a death sentence. Never. And in too many circumstances, it has been. We're lucky to have you, Director Peters. I'm glad you took this job. It's a Thank tough you, one. Senator. It's a challenge. And I think you handle it well. We don't agree on everything, but that's never going to happen. Uh, but I do respect you very much for all the work that you're putting into this effort. General Horowitz, you are a treasure to this government and to this country. You keep us honest, and that's your job, and you do it well. We're lucky to have you. And I want to say for all of the workers in the Bureau of Prisons, but especially those who are at risk in the discharge of their duties, thank you. We could not keep this country safe without you, and I appreciate all of those at every level in the Bureau of Prisons who make that possible. There will be some questions for the record. You've seen them before. You better respond to General or Senator Grassley. will remind you that you didn't. And others will, too. I don't want to pick on Chuck, but he's, he loves to get his letters answered. So thanks for being here today, and this hearing stands adjourned. Thank you, Senator.